know, some of these decouple scenarios where you have a PDF separate, separated, you really have to look at, you know, what you're getting out of it. One carrier, actually, we talked to did decide that a PDF made sense, not a cable carrier, but because they wanted a single point to essentially con configure uh, QoS policies. Um, you know, it can be made to work. I think it's a pretty challenging architecture to make, make to work. Now, in, in, in the other uh, other parts of the IMS world, you have the PDF also controlling the media element, which to me makes no sense at all. It can be done. I don't see how the carrier saves money or you know, produces risk or produces OPEX or any of those kinds of things. I think. That kind of architecture is just very hard to get to work. A PDF that's only doing, uh, you know, policy management through some kind of interface like RX or GQ from an application manager or an SBC, that could be made to work quite nicely. Again, you have to look at what you're getting out of it, right? Some of these, some of these things, you have to be very skeptical, skeptical about these architectures because they come from architectural bodies that that's really all they do, right? And uh, very little field testing has gone on for that kind of uh, deployment. So, very simple. I agree, you know, both Don and Ravi. Uh, in the science experience, uh, we've done like the packet cable certification stuff like that. That having the separate PDF, the, the Cambit type thing, which is a network-wide service, is it, not only the way we've tested it, but also it's consistent how we do centralized policy decision ourselves. You know, it uses our PSX route service, so it's consistent how we do it. It's just like I already said, GQ Prime, RX, okay, we change the interface. I'll take a, another question. Yes. In terms of uh, the requirements, which is more like the end users being transferred, the network being transferred, whether it's board interaction, the user interaction, as well as the PC being in the network, uh, where you are in the sort of sense of donating the signal and the media. Uh, has it, what are the challenges that you have faced in the deployments where there have been conflicts where uh, when two and one are interacting, the company is in the Glenn, do you want to do you want to start? Seeing you didn't talk last time around. Well, well sure. Uh, yeah, that's a very common uh, question and issue for almost all the customers is the kind of the call model interaction between various protocols, whether it's uh, a call originating on an asterisk system on an IAX SIP trunk. Uh, when you get a message that's kind of a H three two three message, how do you map that to a particular? Uh, interface that's going to make sense um, to the subscriber but in general as a as you're demarking in the network you have a UNI and an NNI that helps you basically steer the interaction for the call model to say okay well I'm not going to propagate that to the endpoint through the network because it doesn't make sense on an NNI interface so I'm going to stop that on the UNI interface did I understand the question correctly though I was So um, IP transparency has been uh, a discussion topic, uh, and, and how much role you should play in that uh, in that IP flow. Um, it can be a bit of a snowball effect, right? Because now if you uh, start uh, imposing yourself on the on the control as well as the media, and you start changing things around, now uh, now you're completely hiding um, you know, these other areas of the network. Um, so so that can be that can impose requirements like accounting, for example. Now you've if you don't have transparency. Then uh, you have you, you have to have some mapping where accounting becomes a challenge beyond that device. On the other hand, that's why the session border controller, because it, it, it's not that um, IP transparency um, necessarily is is always a requirement. What happens is uh, it, it, you you may re, you may require uh, um, session border controller to connect two different uh, networks completely. The idea of a single internet um, where you require IP transparency for things like accounting, it's just um, it's a fallacy. It's not it's not possible. There are different networks with different addressing schemes. Uh, there are firewalls in these different areas of the networks. Um, there just aren't enough V4 addresses. So it's almost pointless to uh, to attempt uh, uh, IP transparency, um, and that session border controller then assumes some of the requirements like accounting, um, and and it can then benefit you from being able to touch these other networks. Um, that wouldn't otherwise be reachable through a transparent IP plane. Okay. I had the impression that Bob wanted to say something to that. Yeah, I was going to say, another thing also is that it isn't necessarily a conflict, but just making it easier for the endpoints to interoperate. So, for instance, 
um, one of the things that the early applications of the Sonus MBS was to be able to perform a codec negotiation to, to be able, like if you had two endpoints that had mutual lists of codecs, and we would in fact say, we'll take the common denominator, taking the load off the endpoints, having to sort out what we're going to use to talk. Same thing, or if you have corporate standards in your core for how you want to carry fax or DTMF, that type of inner working, not just simply relay, but actual inner working changing to what you need, either the transverse your core or what the endpoints need, can be done by the border element. And that can take some of that conflict off, plus then like, like Don said, when you get down to the nitty gritty of things like SIP transparency, but even at the higher level, the border element can contribute to that and help make it easier for the endpoints to interoperate. I would interject. I mean, one of the interesting things is that when you look at any interoperability interworking challenge, it's not usually that hard. You've got one endpoint which is using an inappropriate header or something like that, and you can fix it up. The real issue is how many different endpoints are out there and how many different combinations you get between endpoints. So you know, hundreds of endpoints and therefore thousands of potential protocol fix-ups. Yeah, if I understand your question correctly, this is really one of the key reasons SBCs exist to essentially provide that transparency in a in a world where you have different kinds of devices, right? If the world had the same kinds of devices, that if the world didn't need security as well, you know, the SBCs didn't don't really need to exist. So our job essentially is to provide that transparency and the architecture of the device is to, you know, it's essentially to allow for that kind of transparency while not being really transparent. For example, providing topology hiding while being transparent, right? Yeah. Well, let's face it, the standards bodies like the IETF or the IMS don't really like SBCs because SBCs sit there and do things that they're not supposed to do, right? So, but SBCs exist. But the truth is that carriers like it because... Carriers love it. Carriers love it because they, they, they solve real problems. Okay, I think probably we should take a break because we're into lunch now. Um, but as I said, we're happy to stand, hang around and take individual questions if people want to do that. Thank you very much. Thanks to the panelists. <laughs>